I think. He's a distinguished professor in our department and the director of nuclear uh, reactor program here. But we, you may not know the following. <laughs> so let me just okay. read a few insights. <laughs> he obtained his BS from the uh, University of Missouri Aurora, Master of uh, Science in Engineering and PhD from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, all in nuclear engineering. Uh, his technical interest include fundamental research on neutron thermalization in matter, radiation measurement for data validation and material non-destructive examination, and development and utilization of intense radiation sources, reactors and accelerators. So the part that you may not know, he chairs the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency Research Group 42 on thermal neutron scattering flow data, which is very important. He is a member of National Nuclear uh, Security Administration Nuclear Data Advisory Board, a member of the steering committee for the International Group on uh, Research Reactors. He is a recipient of NC State Hauka Foundation Engineering Research Achievements Award and a fellow of nuclear, uh, American Nuclear Society. And the last thing you probably know, his uh, group at NC State is, prim is the primary contributor to the thermal scattering flow data for the recent release of ND END. NDFB 8.0, uh, which is evaluated to have it. Please join me to welcome. Thank you. Dr. Avramova, and I didn't think you were going to read that whole thing. So. Did, you, did you know all of them? I, well, I don't know. Uh, but I'm uh, very glad to uh, speak to you today. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, I last spoke at a seminar at NC State. In fact, the last time I did it was when I was interviewing for my job here, and that was 17 years ago. So. When Dr. Avumova asked that uh, maybe I could speak, uh, I thought, well, that will be a new experience for me. I speak everywhere else. Uh, maybe time I speak at NC State this time. So I decided to uh, go through the experience again. I'm just as nervous as I did when I did my job interview back in, I think it was summer of 2001. And so, <laughs> so uh, glad to have you all here and share with you a little bit uh, of what we do uh, in my group. Uh, it's the LEAP Laboratories. LEAP stands for Low Energy Interaction Physics. Uh, and uh, in the group, we have uh, many aspects that we address, but mainly a lot of them are focused on understanding how these uh, particle beams and radiation beams interact with materials for several purposes. Uh, it could be a practical purpose like uh, non-destructive examination probing, uh, it, and it could be for really a fundamental purpose like understanding the physics of the interaction itself. And what I want to talk about today is a look at how understanding the physics of the interaction uh, of neutrons and achieving the low energy uh, neutron distribution that we see in thermal reactors is really becoming essential and important for uh, advanced uh, reactor analysis. At least people think that way, and I'm one of them. Uh, I want to first start with acknowledgments, uh, of course, the group uh, essential, the graduate students, even our undergraduate participants uh, through the years, postdocs, research staff members at NC State here uh, have been all throughout, I would say, a 20-year period right now that we have been going at it. Uh, in this area of research, uh, the contribution uh, has been made by uh, these MV, uh, uh, MVPs. Uh, and of course, the collaboration with our various collaborators around the country. We have collaborations ongoing with uh, Idaho National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Bettis uh, Naval Labs. So uh, this has been an area of uh, really uh, high in interest. Uh, to uh, various uh, nuclear engineering community participants uh, in, in nuclear data 
and in reactive physics at the same time. And I want to acknowledge the funding. This is the lifeline of what we do, all the, uh, you know, the ability to support our students and support our researchers and acquire equipment and all of that is uh, through the gracious funding of the uh, Office of Nuclear Energy in DOE, uh, NNSA's Criticality uh, Safety Program, uh, and also Naval Reactor Program, who have been extremely generous with us. Uh, just to give an overview and a motivation over here, these are cartoons that I just copied. I'm, you know, I don't really focus on much of the details over here because uh, several concepts have emerged in the past few years of advanced reactors. Uh, there is the advanced high temperature reactor. There is the fluoride high temperature reactor. And in all of these concepts, if you look at the core itself, there are ingredients in the core uh, that shape literally uh, the uh, performance of the reactor. Uh, and I say literally because they end up shaping the neutron energy spectrum, and these are thermal reactors. They've, therefore, they are responsible for defining the thermal energy spectrum, which is the driver of the reactor behavior. And the main constituents uh, that emerged over the past few years, and you know, we, were, we went through uh, many uh, variations and uh, manifestations of, of what we call advanced reactors. So there was terminology of uh, uh, Gen 4 reactors, for example, at one point in time. And all of these, the thermal uh, reactor choice in them was a core that is uh, graphite uh, driven uh, for shaping the thermal spectrum, uh, that the fuel is uh, primarily particle fuel, trapsol fuel, uh, coated particles uh, of UCO or UO2 or something like that. And nowadays, uh, we are starting to talk more and more about molten salt uh, being used in the core of the reactor. FLIB is a variation of molten salt. Uh, and that molten salt is either emerging as a coolant or even more than that as a moderator and a shaper of the neutron energy distribution in the core. So these two constituents became very interesting. Why? Because our knowledge uh, of their thermalization characteristics was found to be lacking. Uh, we thought we understand how they worked because we built some of those reactors. But a lot of what we did was uh, very much empirical in nature by trial and error uh, through experimental implementation and adjustments. And we never had a true predictive capability uh, that supports uh, analysis of these reactors in terms of an operational point of view or even a safety point of view. And here what I want to show is a representative thermal spectrum in, uh, spectrum in the core of the reactor. You can see this very large thermal uh, component of the spectrum. And what I did is I overlaid on it uh, the fission uh, cross sections. And you could see that the, uh, the thermal spectrum lies uh, at, uh, in the range that could be 1 over V uh, behavior of the cross section. Or also, it could uh, extend into a region that has resonances in the fission cross section. In plutonium-239, which of course develops in a thermal reactor core as you operate the reactor, there is a large, significant uh, resonance at uh, 0 0.3 eV. In uranium-235 even, there is a small one just like that at around the same energy. And you can imagine if the uh, determination of the characteristics of this thermal spectrum, its average energy, is not accurate, meaning suppose the spectrum shifts one way or the other, uh, there will be substantial consequences to the reaction rate predictions in the core, fission reaction rates in particular. And in that case, you are talking about immediately operational concerns, or if you have some kind of a transient behavior, you are talking about uh, safety concerns uh, and feedback uh, considerations that come into play. Because of course, uh, if you are missing the prediction of the behavior of the thermal spectrum during a, let's say, developing transient, you will be mispredicting uh, the feedback behavior of the reactor. And so when one looks at this, uh, it emerges immediately that we need accurate 
uh, thermal uh, kernel data uh, for these reactors. And what I showed, of course, was a graphite core, if I did not mention it. Uh, what people have noticed, uh, people have noticed in a graphite core reactor like the treat reactor uh, is exactly what I was talking about, missing the ability to predict criticality. Uh, what people have noticed through the years that in a graphite core reactor, if they did the calculations in what may be considered the appropriate way and used the appropriate scattering kernels, they would predict for a critical reactor a K effective of 0.97, which means it's 0 0.03 off from what we observe. And if I ask a nuclear engineer, if you miss criticality by 0 0.03, is that large or small? Large. large. How much is that? Can you give it to me in numbers that we like to use? Like PCMs? 3, That's 3,000 PCMs difference. And if I'm a reactor operator, a reactor user, and I start missing my K eigenvalue by thousands of PCMs, I know I have issues in predicting the behavior of my reactor. The same thing happened in many of these loadings uh, of the core. And in order for them to come closer, what they started doing is they started fudging, uh, which is what we always do in nuclear engineering. We go in and we play with what? We play with the cross sections. And so what they started doing is they started introducing uh, a tunable variable into the cross sections where they would change the amount of uh, the free atom contribution to the uh, cross section and therefore uh, the reaction rate uh, depending on that. And they would stop it and they found out that if they actually uh, allow the free atom contribution to be nearly 40%, uh, then what they would uh, get is very close close values to the uh, K effective of one that they wanted to achieve. And similarly with the predictions of inferred uh, reaction rates in the core for fission rates, they were off by about 7% and when they fudged they got a little bit closer. And all of this was done with NDEF uh, 7.1 uh, data libraries. You, you might be, some of you are already running that in your reactor calculations until today. Even NDEF 8 is out, uh, but many users uh, are still using NDEF 7.1. Not only that, this is now uh, a Proteus benchmark model of a graphite reactor. Uh, this is the Proteus facility uh, at PSI, and this uh, facility was a pebble bed benchmark, and it was at room temperature, and uh, the, these calculations, I believe Colby, uh, did those calculations and what she did is uh, she uh, plotted here the benchmark and she showed how NDEF 7.1 behaves in comparison to the benchmark and you could see that the K effective again uh, systematically and drastically underestimates uh, the benchmark value for K effective. Uh, the deviations can be on the order of 100, hundreds of PCM to again thousands of PCM. And so we know from different sources that the use of thermal scattering cross sections, uh, at least for a gra graphitic uh, neutronic system, uh, is missing the mark. Uh, more so when we look microscopically uh, at the cross sections directly and we start plotting the cross sections uh, of NDEF 7.1 and this is the solid line against experimental data. Uh, so we looked at it in terms of use, being used in a reactor, like the TREAT reactor. We looked at it in terms of being used in a benchmark, like the Proteus benchmark. And now we look at it uh, directly in terms of comparison between total cross-sections uh, measured and calculated. And again, we see that the, cal uh, the calculated cross-section, and let me say more precisely evaluated cross-sections, miss the mark over here. Uh, and so we have all kinds of evidence uh, that there is something going on with thermal scattering and with the cross sections and with the ability to describe and analyze a reactor that is driven by a graphite core, never mind molten salts because we actually don't even have the cross section for molten salts. Uh, in fact, uh, we are just starting to develop them in my group, in the LEAP group, and we are hoping to contribute them uh, in a few months uh, to NDEF. 
And so I want to then now uh, do a flashback. Uh, so I want to go back in time. And you know, if you go faster than the speed of light, uh, you might be able to. We haven't proven it yet. Uh, but uh, I've seen movies where they do this. And, and if I consider time zero, and time zero in my mind when everything started is 1997. And why is it 1997? That's because that's when I graduated and started working. And I was a uh, postdoc working in the basement of a lab, trying to set up this facility over here. Uh, this is a 14 MeV neutron generator. Uh, and I was asked at the time, do you know how to set up a slowing down time experiment? I said, absolutely. Yes, of course. And they said, and, and, and do you know how to use it to do uh, fissile material detection? I said, yes, of course. I had no idea at all about how to set up a slowing down spectrometer. I had no idea what, how would I would use it in, uh, in uh, detecting plutonium. Or I had no idea. I just said, yes, got the job offer. I drove my family to Texas from Ann Arbor. And then I went back and I drove a neutron generator from Ann Arbor to uh, Texas, well, Ann Arbor, Texas. And then they said to me, we're looking for lead, but we don't have lead to set up uh, a slowing down spectrometer. And if you know what a slowing down spectrometer, at the, uh, it, this is a concept that emerged in the Soviet Union in the mid-1950s. And it's not unlike a uh, time of flight experiment uh, where you could associate time and energy and then be able to actually predict cross-sections or measure cross-sections based on that association between time and energy. Uh, but with a slowing down spectrometer, what you do is you actually inject neutrons in a slowing down pile, and the neutrons during the slowing down process have a correlation between time and energy that I will show. I couldn't find lead that much of lead. I, could, I needed about a, a meter and a half by meter and a half by meter and a half of lead. And there was nowhere on campus and no, nobody could give me that much lead, which is what they wanted. It happened to be that in Texas they had a graphite pile. And I said, well, how, why don't we use graphite? Uh, and I went ahead and built a pile made out of graphite. And I started doing the measurements in it. Uh, I also stumbled upon a fuel pin that had 10% plutonium-239 in it. I don't know how they had it, but I stuck it in the pile, and I, and I you know, we operated this, slow, uh, this neutron generator, 14 MeVs. Uh, we set it up to pulse at one microsecond pulses, and we watched. This is a microsecond, and we did the, I did the calculations in MCMP. I used to know how to use MCMP back then. Uh, and, uh, and then we did the measurements, and everything looked beautiful. Uh, we understood what this means because the detectors were used were not ideal the way they were in the code. Uh, they had a charge, they were uh, proportional detectors, so they had a charge collection time on the order of a couple of microseconds. And you could see that this spilled over to a couple of microseconds. And then it tracks the reaction rate, the time dependent re reaction rate in the detector very nicely. And it keeps on going. And we, at this moment in time, we hit a bump. And that bump was corresponding, and I'll show how that corresponds, to the 0.3 EV cross-section uh, of uh, plutonium-239. So we could actually detect that there is plutonium-239 in a sample when we do that. And why was I doing that? I was working in safeguards before it became fashionable. And so I, I was doing that type of stuff, nuclear security and safeguards and stuff like that. And then it kept on going like this. And and then I saw this, and I thought, oh, what an anomaly. Why is it good everywhere except here? And I started looking at it, and, and you know, celebrations were happening in, in the lab. Everybody was happy that the equipment is working, the measurements are good. Uh, and I kept on going. I, I was a little bit, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I had an obsessive compulsive disorder. I was obsessed with this. And I was asking myself, why does it look this way? Why do I have this systematic deviation uh, from the data? So I went back and I started looking at what happens when the neutrons slow down inside the graphite pile. 
the neutrons started at high energy, 14 MeVs. It's in this range of energy, inelastic type of uh, behavior in the nuclear part. And this is a plot of the total cross-section of graphite. If you go to NDEF, you can pull that. And then when they slow down, they reach below 1 MeV, and you start approaching 100 KeV. You start hitting a region which is known in the nuclear cross-section business uh, as the potential scattering region. These are billiard ball type of scattering. And this is when slowing down takes place. So what's happening in a moderating system like a graphite pile or any other moderator, including water, is that you're starting to hit this region and slowing down until you reach about EV type Do you start reaching an energy limit where the neutron is no longer interacting purely at the nuclear level. It is actually starting sense the in the system and the binding between the atoms and you start seeing this emerge here these are not resonances a lot of people think that these are resonances just like these these are manifestations of interference effects uh, due to the structure and manifestations of the Bragg condition of scattering and lambda equals 2d sine theta type of behavior. Uh, and then if you continue on, this becomes impossible and the cross section go, uh, drops and goes back to rise as 1 over uh, V. And in this case, the interaction is purely an energy exchange interaction. It's a little bit different from here because this is not an energy exchange interaction in the high region. The neutron purely loses energy, does not gain energy from the system. In this range, below 1 EV, the neutron is actually starting to give energy to the system and get energy back from the system. Why? Because the energy of the neutron is on the order of the binding energies between uh, the atoms in the system. So if we model this in a graphite pile, what we see is we have a source, and what we see is that the neutron spectrum, very interestingly, as it goes through this region over here, it starts become, to become very narrow in energy distribution. Uh, and it focuses around an average energy. In fact, if you want, you can co connect the energy of the neutrons, their average energy, with time. So if you do a measurement in time, you're able to correlate with energy. And you can establish that correlation theoretically, or even better nowadays, you could do it through a precise Monte Carlo calculation that can give you that behavior uh, all the way down here. And you notice immediately that at these time limits, above 10 to the negative 4, uh, which is what I have here, it's the thermal energy. Neutrons have reached thermal energy. So that immediately told me, after digging and uh, looking at the uh, results, that the cross-sections that I ought to worry about are the cross-sections of thermal neutrons. And what do these look like? Like I said, the neutron now is starting to feel materials effects, binding effects between the atoms. And thermal scattering is really a very fascinating area because it, it's an area that connects neutronics to actually material science because it, the neutron is sampling the structure of the material. And we shouldn't be surprised because that's what people actually use to study matter. If you go to places like the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge National Lab, or you go to the NIST reactor, they're using thermal and cold neutron beams to probe matter all the time. Why? Because the thermal and the cold beams can sense the structure of matter. In fact, if we look at the theory of uh, thermal neutron scattering, we find that the cross-section is, uh, is composed of three components. The first component is the nuclear cross-section that we all are used to. That's the interaction of the neutron with the nucleus, uh, and it's a free atom cross-section. The second component is just a ratio of incoming and exiting energies. And the third component, which is the key component, is what the condensed matter physicists call the dynamic structure factor. So it is actually not a nuclear component, and it's a pure material property that describes in inverse space, not in real space, uh, the distribution of momentum and energy states that are available for the neutron 
to interact with when it goes into a moderating system. And all moderators are described this way. That was a great clue, and once I started seeing this, what occurred to me at the time, and it was again 1997, is how can I access the dynamic structure factor? And is it correct for graphite? And is it correct for the other moderators? And what was happening at the time, and it was quite opportune and lucky, is that these types of, uh, and, and you've heard about this probably uh, through other seminars, is that uh, techniques of atomistic simulations were starting to come about that would allow you to actually calculate such atomistic quantities. Uh, you could calculate uh, the force field distributions uh, in the uh, uh, atomic structure or molecular structure that you're interested in, and then you could proceed to convert that force field uh, distribution into the type of information from which you can extract the dynamic structure factor. The process is not that simple, uh, but it's actually clear. Uh, it, there is a lot of nitty gritty in that uh, and a lot of details, but it's actually, right? But it's actually uh, clear. Uh, and, and we did one more thing uh, when we started moving uh, and working with this uh, stuff is that we noticed that the standard codes that are being used by, the, by industry uh, and by the community are somewhat lacking. Uh, and so what we started doing is we started developing our own code system, which we call Flash. And what Flash does is it accepts the output of all of these atomistic uh, simulation uh, analysis procedures and then produces the S alpha beta, the dynamic structure factor, or what we nuclear engineers call the scattering law. And if you go to the NDEF websites, you'll see that you are able to download the scattering law of a particular material. The funny thing is we put that in a nuclear data library and it has nothing to do with nuclear. It's a pure material property. And so uh, there is a little bit of misconception there. And we started actually uh, preaching uh, this message. We published uh, quite a few papers on this issue, uh, starting with the early 2000s, talking about uh, the uh, fundamental uh, principles, calculations of the scattering law, uh, talking about the modern techniques uh, to calculate the scattering law. And we formulated an entire analysis paradigm for this uh, that has now been accepted even internationally. Uh, it, what, what this has done is do something that was not possible before. It opened up, uh, it opened up uh, the entire space uh, for generating the scattering law and the cross sections for any material you can imagine even materials that you might want to tailor. And you might ask yourself, why would I want to tailor a material? Well, you might want to tailor a material because you might want to impact the thermal spectrum one way. You could actually start thinking of engineering a nuclear reactor core and the thermal spectrum on the co in the core from atomistic levels. Therefore, this represents, in my opinion, for the first time, an implementation that shows a path for a neutronic multiscale. We always talk about the material multiscale. Now we have a path where we can start at this micro level and go all the way to K effective, which, is, which was not possible before. And based on this, NF8 was uh, produced with the thermal scanning and libraries in it. This is the, all the libraries in NDEF-8 right now. Uh, this was, and it represents, the largest contribution in thermal scattering to NDEF-8 in the past 40 years. And all the red is NC state, right? So go pack. And, uh, and uh, as you can see, we have the biggest portion of the contribution. And not only that, uh, other parts of the contribution were made by our alumni. So by far, what we did here is migrating and we are the greatest contributors uh, in terms of NDF8. Now I wanna go back to graphite. Graphite is a very interesting material because in the process of developing all of this know-how and capability, uh, we actually started noticing 
that graphite is not something ordinary. It's actually an artificial material. It's a composite material, and every time somebody makes it, the structure is different. So you cannot have a one-size-fits-all cross-sections for graphite, not like, for example, fission cross-section of U-235, where it will not change. But this is a cross-section that's going to change all the time. And in fact, nuclear graphite that we started working with is a material that looks this way. It's got a lot of pores and open structures in it. So you can't really model it as a crystalline material the way we would try to model graphite. You would have to include in it these openings and, uh, and uh, imperfections and porosity in order to be able to reflect appropriately uh, the force field in the material and reflect appropriately the uh, momentum and energy states that the neutron would have available to them. And so we started working with this, and this is what I showed you before, these graphite cross-sections at different energies, and we proposed a model, what we call the porous graphite model, uh, for nuclear graphite. And with this model, let's see if this works. Ah, and you can see that with this model, we were actually able to start fitting experimental data much better than before much better than before. What remained is some experimental data here, and what we discovered that this experimental data actually is not nuclear graphite, it's crystalline graphite. And so even with the crystalline libraries that NDEF had in the past, they missed the crystalline graphite data, but we actually have now the tools to even do the crystalline graphite data better. So we created a family of cross-sections that depend on porosity also. So if you have a different porosity graphite, maybe not similar to what they measured, you could also use uh, those cross-sections to describe and model your reactor. And then we designed an experiment, and that was the second observation from my early days of work. The second observation was Slowing down is an excellent technique to benchmark thermalization because when you build a slowing down system, it's a simple system. You don't have a fuel in it. You don't have anything in it except the material of interest. And therefore, it sort of resembles a separate effects type of experiment. And we went to the Orella facility, which is now shut down, uh, because it was a pulse neutron system that we could use at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, the Orella facility was able to inject pulses uh, that are on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds in width and uh, with an energy on the order of one MeV uh, into a pile of graphite that we built. And we've, uh, instru we instrumented the facility uh, with detectors that surrounded the pile that we can monitor in energy and in time. And so we could collect the time spectra because the time spectra correlate with energy spectra and we can tell that we reach the thermal range and we can also monitor the typical energy response of the detector for quality assurance and to make that our detectors are working properly. And we actually set it up and we started injecting uh, these pulse pulses in it. This is the physical picture. It was a big pile of graphite. The graphite pile itself was not that big, but the shielding that we had to put around it in order to prevent artifacts such as room return and things like that. We designed all that to minimize such effects and to have uh, as a high of accuracy measurement uh, as we possibly can. Uh, the green uh, materials here, who knows what that is? This is borated polyethylene. And so we use that as our shielding material around uh, our graphite pile. And again, this is what we were aiming for. Just a reminder that we will inject the uh, neutron uh, pulse. It will walk down the energy time path, and then we can actually capture it in thermal energies and compare the response, the time-dependent response of our detectors. And this is actually what you see as the average energy of the neutrons that we simulated. If you notice here, the neutrons are reaching uh, some sort of equilibrium energy at around 0 0.05 eV. 0 0.05 eV, you could even calculate that theoretically. It's 2 kT, uh, which is the average energy extracted from a Maxwellian thermal neutron spectrum. So everything came together. It makes sense. Uh, this also part of the analysis, we wanted to see how many collisions 
would the neutron have to interact in our pile before it reaches that thermal range at that time? And for both of our detectors, we saw that it probably is on the order of a few hundred collisions, maybe a hundred or so. Let's see. These are the time uh, the energy signals. You can see that in each detector, if you connect the detector to an MCA, uh, what you'll see is the Q value of the reaction. And these were lithium uh, scintillators. So you, we, were, we were getting the Q value of the lithium uh, absorption reaction for detection of neutrons. And if we deviated from this, it would have been a problem. It would have told us that detector is not working well. We had, uh, the detector was sometimes surrounded with cadmium uh, in order for us to give, uh, to establish a, a time benchmark. Why? Because we knew that if the neutrons reached about 0 0.05 EV, they will be absorbed completely in cadmium, uh, and that would be a marker that the neutrons have dropped to the thermal range. And we went ahead with this, and we did the measurements, and the dots that you see are the time uh, reaction rates in the detector, the time-dependent reaction rates in the detector. We did it for the uh, detector without cadmium, and we did it with the detector with cadmium. And you can see that for the detector with cadmium, the reaction rate dropped uh, and disappeared. And what we ended up, uh, that ended up happening at about the energy I was talking about, and, uh, around 0 0.5 EV, and in the vicinity of about 100 microseconds. And so, Above 100 microseconds, 200, 300, 400, we have entered the thermal range. So that peak here is the thermal range. These are thermal neutrons. And we did the calculations, again with MCMP, and what we saw is if we do free atom analysis, the uh, reaction rate in the detector is exaggerated. And if we do S alpha beta analysis with NDEF 7.1, the reaction rates are underestimated. So the truth lied between the two limits. And, and so there, no wonder, no wonder that people that are trying to model reactors, people that are to, uh, trying to model neutronic benchmarks are missing uh, the predictions because no matter what they do, in order to meet the predictions, they have to do what the treat folks did, which is mix and match cross sections to come to the middle point, right? On the other hand, we then started running our porous graphite model and the S alpha beta cross sections that we generate, generate to represent nuclear graphite. And what happened is this. So you could see it. It collapsed immediately around the experimental uh, data. So that was a, a, a great feeling, a culmination of many years of uh, analysis and measurements and design and planning. It actually is the culmination of many PhD theses and master's projects and things like that. And so uh, this did not happen as quickly as I sh I'm showing right now. It took a while. Uh, so once we knew this, we were able then to go back uh, to the benchmarks. And uh, Colby over here started running uh, these benchmarks for us maybe a year ago. And this is what I showed you before. Uh, and then we started uh, putting in uh, three types of data, crystalline data. This is now in NDEF 8, the crystalline data. It does slightly better than NDEF 7.1. But then we started produ introducing our porous models. And you could see that for the porous range that we introduced in uh, NDEF 8, our cross sections are able to predict the K effective for the various Proteus uh, uh, configurations much better than NDEF 7.1 was able to do it. So again, that was another verification uh, that uh, the uh, porous graphite model in NDEF 8 is actually superior to NDEF 7.1. And of course, when uh, we showed the Orella experiment, uh, data and when we showed the Proteus benchmark and we showed the agreement with the total cross sections, all these co components uh, convinced uh, the cross section evaluation working group, CSWIG, uh, and the uh, NDAG uh, community, uh, the advisory group, that this is uh, likely the best graphite data that exists in the world. Uh, so, it gets stuck a little bit. So, what's next? Uh, I wear another hat, right? And so I, I work with the Polestar reactor. I have to advertise the Polestar reactor. So I can't have a 
presentation without the pulse star reactor in it, right? And so, but I'm not doing this randomly. Yeah, we have the pulse star reactor. It's great. It's one of, one of a kind. And I, you know, I kid you not. And we have all of these capabilities in the pulse star reactor. And we are now moving forward through a new NEUP project to start using these capabilities at the pulse star reactor. Here in the reactor, we have a diffraction system that can actually produce for us uh, monochromatic, monoenergetic neutron beams. And we can actually do our own transmission measurements with single energy neutrons to study the total cross section for different variations of graphitic materials. We have other facilities. This is our positron beam. This is our imaging system. This is our fuel testing facility. And this is our ultra cold neutron source facility. And this is what I'm talking about over here. Uh, we have started to set up uh, a transmission uh, beam and a transmission uh, measurement station over here. And we can produce these various types of, I'm listing them here in wavelength, but they can go from about 10 milli electron volts to about 70 to 80 milli electron volts over here. Uh, and uh, we are now preparing the samples uh, to do these uh, transmission measurements. The project is in its first year. We are halfway through the first year uh, right now. What else has happened? Because of all of these developments, we created an OECD NEA group, that's subgroup 42. Uh, these are some of the participants in, sub, uh, in, in this subgroup. And we have just finished uh, uh, three years uh, work that, uh, that uh, resulted in this uh, summary report that's now being published by NEA uh, to describe the state of the art of uh, thermal neutron scattering in the world, the state of the art computationally, the st state of the art experimentally, uh, and we are now actually moving forward uh, with forming a, an extension subgroup, the second subgroup that's going to work between 2019 and 2023. Uh, furthering uh, the state of the art. Uh, another thing that we are doing next uh, is looking at the Orla experiment with a lot of encouragement from the community to actually contribute it as a benchmark to the uh, IC, uh, ICSBEP uh, community. That's the International Criticality Safety Benchmark Experiments. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping that the student will join us uh, who is able to uh, develop this uh, experiment into an actual benchmark that goes into uh, the handbooks over here or here, either into the reactor physics handbook or the uh, ICSBEP uh, handbook. So, I'm at the end. Uh, modern techniques, uh, those were key, uh, that we were able to realize the fact that these atomistic techniques can be used uh, to do high fidelity TSL uh, analysis. At the moment uh, when we actually started uh, looking into these techniques in the late 90s, uh, Cohn, the inventor of DFT in 1998, won the Nobel Prize. So that gives you uh, some sense of the popularity of these techniques. They started actually emerging in the late 90s and they have become really popular by now for many applications. And this is one of those applications, but it's unique because it links to neutronics. It's not simply an another manifestation of a materials modeling problem. The pulse slowing down time technique is a direct approach for benchmark purposes, which we have proposed, accepted by the community, and we're developing it further, hopefully, <clears throat> what we will end up doing is bring an accelerator facility over here. Uh, we're actually working on that. Uh, that can serve that purpose, which is to s set up benchmark experiments. And we believe, and I am a strong uh, believer in the holistic approach to science, uh, experimentation <coughs> plus computational analysis, plus modeling and theory, because putting that uh, together uh, results in the best work possible, uh, results in the state uh, of the art, in the best understanding possible. And that's how I started, and that's how we're continuing uh, in the LEAP uh, group. And with that, I thank you. You want to switch fields? You want to switch fields?
Yes. So you talked about a porosity model for reactor grade. How do I know how porous my reactor graphite is? So we went with density. Okay. And we decided that we're going to assume that the uh, deviation in density represents lack of matter. And then we distributed this lack of matter uh, in first order as single vacancies in the graphite model. And we distributed uniformly. And that was our first order model. Never really thought it's going to work, but it worked. And it worked so well uh, to the point where the experiments were matching better than ever. The data was agreeing with experimental data. And we just ran with it. Uh, we might go back and revisit because we know for sure that the porosity is not single vacancies and it's not distributed uniformly. So something to be looked at. Uh, you mean the Q value? Q value. Yeah, that's, that's the Q value calculated for a reaction, which would be uh, represented through the uh, change in mass okay. between reactants and products. Right. So that's a, new, a fundamental nuclear reaction property. Yeah, and so you could, if you had a detector that detects all the uh, products of a nuclear reaction, that's what it will detect. It will detect the Q value because the Q value appears at the kinetic energy of the products, and it will be deposited in the detector. And so that's what we went for. Just, that was our QA, quality assurance parameter, in the experiment. I was confusing with other Q factors. I was curious what your thanks. No problem. And of course, what I want to mention is now uh, we're working on the SALT uh, models. So, yes. Which one? Uh, Here? Yeah. Okay. It's a, uh, it's a powder diffraction, right? Yeah. Ah, yeah. it's a powder diffractometer. But you know how a powder diffractometer works. A powder diffractometer uh, takes a thermal beam m uh, and then monochromates. Takes, uh, it, it has a monochromator that slices a single energy out of the thermal beam. And that single energy then you, is used for powder diffraction. But what we decided to do is the monochromator that we have, this is it actually, this is the monochromator that we have inside the shield over here, we can rotate it at different angles. And when we rotate it at, uh, rotate it at different angles, we can select different wavelengths and we can select different energies. And so now we have a monoenergetic source of neutrons that gives us different beams as a function of that angle. And we can now use it not as a powder diffractometer, but as a transmission experiment uh, device. So that's just an extension. Uh, do you have a question about it? Oh, that was a pulsed experiment. So totally, this will measure cross-section. That one was just to look at the consistency between calculated and measured reaction rates. Totally different. Uh, can you say a few more words about the cold neutron facility? This one? No, the cold neutron track. Uh, you're talking about the ultra cold. Ultra cold. Uh, let's see, which way do I go? Yeah, this one? Yeah, so this facility uh, is designed not to produce a beam, but to actually produce uh, a high density of ultra-cold neutrons, meaning neutrons that have energies on average uh, around uh, 300, 400 nanoelectron volts. That's how low it is. That's why we call it ultra-cold. It's not cold. Uh, and that's very difficult to do uh, because these ultra-cold neutrons, what they do is they warm up anytime they interact with anything. So we would have to be very careful in their production and in their containment. The way we're doing it is that we get uh, the prompt neutrons from the reactor core. Uh, they drift into a moderating system that has heavy water in it. Uh, they become thermal and then they drift into a solid methane system at a 20, uh, 20 Kelvin temperature and they become cold. 
and then they are uh, interacting in a uh, solid deuterium system uh, that is held at uh, liquid helium temperatures, and so they become ultra-cold. And then we expect maybe we'll produce tens to maybe 100 uh, neutrons per centimeter cubed, ultra-cold neutrons, and because of their very long wave, uh, they don't penetrate matter. They actually, if they stay cold, they can stay inside a structure, like a bottle. And we're looking at the creation of neutron bottles, and we'll see. And if we make one, we'll make it in two uh, types. One will be regular and diet. <laughs> Yes, Steve. Do you have any of these experiments planned for the other side of this wall? Yes, that's what I said. Okay, do you know what's on the other side? That's what we call the old reactor bay. Uh, and, and if I go back and maybe and, and, and go, li go over here, this is what Dr. Shannon is referring to. Uh, in the old reactor bay, this is what Fermi did, right? So that was a little bit further from here. But this is in the old reactor bay. So behind this wall, this is what happened here. And we built the first reactor, R1, uh, went critical in 53. Uh, since then, we removed it, and there was nothing going on, a lot of other types of stuff. But we're hoping to clean up the old bay now and install air conditioning, I think, right? and lights, and there'll be a large screen TV, and no, uh, we, we will put a, an accelerator. I thought that you're gonna put the motors If somebody wants to do it, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm all for it. And so we're gonna put an accelerator, it will be a pulse neutron source, and we're gonna use it for various types of experiments, uh, maybe some of them like what I described uh, at the Orella facility. And we're hoping that this summer will be the time, even though I heard there are some complications. There are? Yeah, costs and things like that. For the room or for the cell? For the air conditioning. Oh. <laughs> we want to build reactors, but air conditioning is a problem. <laughs> yes? So, um, I've heard people doing research about uh, modern solar intrusion into the atoms. Only if the intrusion is large. If the intrusion is, you know, we're talking about PPM levels or even larger than that a little bit, I don't think it'll be meaningful because graphite will overwhelm the thermal behavior, the thermalization. Uh, even if the molten salt in the core in general is not in large quantities, graphite will end up defining the thermal spectrum. And so we, we need to see how large is the volume fraction of molten salt and the content, the amount, in, in a core or in a system? Depends. Can you have a question? If not, thank you very much. Thank you.